My name is Joe Roster, and uh, among other things, I uh, like to make spoons from uh, uh, green wood spoons and bowls and, and things like that. I like working with hand tools as a break from the other woodworking that I do and other projects. Clearing a fence row down on my lower pasture there, and there was a cherry tree, and I thought that's about the right size to make uh, some spoons. So today we uh, took and split uh, a little piece of cherry log in two. Uh, this was in this area right here on the other side. And uh, we used a progression of tools to uh, simple carve the simple spoon. It needs a little more refinement, but uh, there's the progression of tools and the finished product. the uh, grain of the material like you want it. Hope this works. Through the pith, it's a way of accurately splitting. <clears throat> See that it followed the grain of the wood right through the pith from one end to the other. A little concerned about this stuff on this end that may echo up into the grain of the wood itself. So I think I make my spoon bowl on this end. Just to give myself a a rough guide of what I want to what I want to produce. And I'll use the tools kind of in a progression, the coarsest of courses to throw to split your basic material. And then a little bit of a chopping axe of some sort. Do some rough work. Get rid of some of the bark and some of the waste material that you don't need right off the bat. This is green, as in it's fresh cut, it's not dry at all, so it works very easily. Green wood works so much easier than letting the wood dry out. This is very, very dangerous. So if you're a young person, don't jump right into this. It's very dangerous. If I wanted to, I could keep working with that, but since it's so green and so easy to cut, I'll switch to the shaving horse for a gripping device. It's like a that grips some material, and I've got two hands. And then I'll use a draw knife because it's named so because you draw the cut to you. With a handle on both ends of my spoon, I can work either hand. First thing I want to do is get rid of that pith. And when you work green wood, you have to work and essentially complete the spoon while it's still green, unless you want to do some sanding. You can do sanding later, but if I just start this and don't finish it, um, especially the bowl of the spoon, it will crack and uh, break apart. See, so you... right there. Get rid of the pit. 
pith. Because if it's in the end of your spoon on either end, it, it's a way for, the, that's where the crack naturally wants to start. So get rid of the, the pith, that's got most of it. Now that's gonna be gnarly and kinda hard to work. Go back and put my, kinda my, what I wanna do back in. Simple little spoon. And I'll switch to, uh, I, I prefer in my process to rough my bowl out with a 3 8 half round or 3 8 gouge. And I work from the outside to the center and gradually increase in depth. When I create one scoop, it leaves a ridge. So the next strike will be taking that ridge out. As you begin to have a, a cavity down there, it makes the work go quicker, more quickly. You can get to depth pretty easily. Again, if this weren't green oh my goodness be a lot more work so, could go a little farther but next i'll switch to a spoon bit gouge got a few nicks time to hone and the grain runs like this so as you cut it's a little hard to explain, but you can cut with the grain until you start back on the other way, and then you're cutting against the grain. So you have what I call quadrants, and your spoon, essentially the grain runs like this. And you can move from this direction to there without digging in. But can you see it dig? I moved into the other quadrant. It's starting to dig into the grain on this other side. I'm going against the grain. It's like the hair on your head or the hair on a dog. It's like petting a dog, the hair backwards. So you can cut from here around to there and quit in that quadrant. Because if you do, you're going to start digging in, go any further. You need to be a little bit ambidextrous. And I can cut from this direction and go that way till about there. And then I have to, ooh, 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 got a problem. Okay, I got way too far. There was a soft spot in the, in the uh, wood there. I got too close. So I just reduced the size of my spoon substantially. There's a little gnarliness in that grain there. So, monitor and adjust. All right, so back to my gouge. That's gonna be a tricky spot on my spoon. We may make it a little bit elongated to get more spoon. All right, so back to where, kind of where I was. I'm with this quadrant. Now I'll switch ends. That's why I left that other handle on my spoon so I can work both ends. I haven't seen anybody else do that, but I'm sure somebody has done it in the past. People have been making spoons a long time.
this area in the middle is kind of a no man's land and you can kind of scoop in two quadrants at once get a bite and carry it on down use your fingers to gauge your depth kind of like a set of calipers in a metal shop or Dig in, I gotta quit. This is gonna have a, a unique bowl. I think I will define the bottom a little better because I'm getting about as deep as I wanna get. I'm gonna begin to to find the handle a little bit better. Bark. Ooh, kind of a sap intrusion there. Didn't expect that. Unless it's made by a blacksmith, I have yet to find a, a draw knife that I liked, a, a modern day manufactured draw knife I've yet to find one that I like as as well as the old ones that I have as you draw the draw knife to you engage the material and slice kind of like you would a pocket knife across the blade and you get a good clean cut that way Okay. Clean up my bowl a little bit. I have, I've made some hook knives myself, but these are made by a gentleman. His name is Rex Harrell. I'm sure he's passed on by now. I, I, I'm not completely sure, but he'd be really old. But this is a, a right and a left-handed crook knife or hook knife. Uh, Violet Hensley, the whittling fiddler. She also uses Rex Harrell knives for carving her fiddles. Um, and I use that to, to clean the bowl. You need a, a right and a left to, to go the direction of the... the quadrant I spoke of earlier. So we're just refining the shape of the bowl and uh, cleaning up the tool marks from the the gouge, uh, the straight gouge and the bowl gouge. I prefer to leave my spoons um, unsanded generally um, and try to leave a little bit of tool mark. Sometimes I, if the grain is real fuzzy, I might, might scrape it a little bit with a, a piece of glass or a, a metal scraper ground to the inside shape of, a, of the bowl, a radius. Different spoon makers have a kind of a style that they develop or evolve into kind of based on the tools that they use and their techniques. And I'm no different than the rest. I've got my kind of style um, I started out making them by, you know, with power tools, band saws and grinders and stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that, but this is relaxing and it's, um, 
I enjoy it more so than the power tool aspect of it. I do a lot of power tool woodworking, don't get me wrong. I'm not opposed to power tools, but I enjoy the... It's not noisy. It's quiet. <laughs> power tools are noisy. Okay, so I'm beginning to get a little more refinement. This is a, called a spoke shave uh, in the wheel making trade. 100 years ago or more. Uh, it was used, of course, as a tool to clean spokes. I've got that one set really fine. So let's just do it. When your grain tells you you're going the wrong way, it it chatters or tears out. So you go back the other way until it. It's kind of like the, the quadrant thing on the inside of the bowl. You've got to, your grain tells you which way to go. <clears throat> when you get this far, Jump of your work, unless you protect it somehow. And I'll get a little piece of rubber that I use. And if you hear it snap, <laughs> which happens sometimes, that means it was, I got horsey with it and broke it. I could saw this off as well, but then I have to get up and I'm here in position. Might as well just so if you think about the size of the chips that we started with from the axe. Then we went to a, a finer yet coarse chip with a draw knife. With aggressive angle, you can get a, a heavy cut with a draw knife. With a less aggressive angle, you can get a finer cut with a draw knife. Um, and then finishing up with a, with a spoke shave. And I'll just kind of keep using this to refine the, the shape. I've got a kind of a dull flat spot there. I've got a problem over here with this, where that wonky grain was, but I'll just keep working this a little bit and let the bowl that I've carved kind of define the, the shape that I want and then bring the outside into alignment with the inside. And then the last thing I like to do is create kind of a chamfer on the outside edge so that the lip of the bowl is not the preeminent point that you scrape around your soup bowl or your pot. I like the edge of the wood out here to hit before the, the rim of the bowl. Uh, it's just a little bit fragile and if I can put a little chamfer around the outside of the bowl leading into the inside of the bowl of the spoon. Then uh, it's a reinforcement that uh, helps to minimize checking and cracking. I've got an issue right there. You see where I got my cut too deep? I gotta get rid of that, so I've gotta all, go all the way down. This is not gonna be a very deep spoon. The shaving horse is such a simple device, but it's you know infinitely adjustable. Just really cool. Uh, this is pretty rough. Not my best work, but you get the idea. My father would finish up. He made handles for hammers and. Things and he would always finish up with a piece of broken glass. So when we go squirrel hunting, if there was a a junk 
heat somewhere, he'd look to see if there was a piece of broken glass that broke into the right shape, and he had little pieces of glass that he'd use to, to scrape with. Now, this is pretty wet and fuzzy. Wait a few days, and I, I might come back and scrape again and minimize the fuzziness of this. I've had a pocket knife nearly all my life. I remember sitting on my grandfather's lap as a, mm, I don't know, three or four years old. And he knew I'd cut myself. His knives, he had a barlow. It was just razor sharp. He knew I'd cut myself with it, but he let me learn about knives and I've respected them. And edge tools in general for that nature, for that matter ever since then, but I've carried a pocket knife all my life. <laughs> I'm playing with fire here. This isn't, at this point, <laughs> it's real easy to bust a span. Anyway, that's, that's pretty much it with uh, some additional refining. And then I finish with uh, um, non-toxic oil. Sometimes I use mineral oil and beeswax, sometimes just beeswax. Um, there are other finishes. Walnut oil is one that, that comes to mind. But uh, any food safe oil, something you're not afraid to eat. I kind of stay away from um, olive oils if they're especially thick heavy but a lightweight cooking oil something you're not afraid to eat and I'm really happy to be part of uh, the Shiloh Museum series and I fully support Shiloh and I hope you do too